Dresden, 1946. This is where Elie Goebel lives. She's just one of hundreds of Trümmerfrauen, the rubble women who helped to rebuild the bombed city. Her daily life is hard. Even if the propaganda photos paint a different picture. Ellie fled Silesia with her children and is struggling to make ends meet. Sag mal, schuldest du mir nicht noch was? Food can only be obtained with ration cards. Deprivation and hunger are constant companions. Like millions of other Germans, Ellie is looking for her family. Haben Sie diese Frau gesehen? Das ist meine Schwester. She's desperately hoping the Dresden Missing Persons Office can help her. Ich kann Ihnen nichts versprechen, verstehen Sie? Ellie dreams of becoming a professional musician, preferably in an orchestra. Die suchen jemanden, der Violine kann. But being a woman, chances are more than slim for Ellie. Hier für dich. Sixteenth of September, nineteen forty-six. More than a year after the end of World War II. After the country's unconditional surrender, the Allied forces occupied and divided Germany into four zones. The east of Germany is under Soviet control, and with it, Dresden, a city known for its impressive Baroque architecture. Once a splendid city dubbed the Florence of the North, Dresden is nothing more than a sea of rubble. The devastating air raids on the night of the 14th of February, 1945, wiped out 30% of the city's homes. Hit particularly hard were the historical Old City and the neighborhoods south of the Elbe River. And it's not just the residents of Dresden that are looking for a new place to stay. Close to 10,000 refugees from the former Eastern territories of Germany are looking as well. The city has its women to thank for the fact that it's slowly being rebuilt. One of these women is Ellie Goebel. Her day starts early. For a year now, she's been working as one of the 580 laborers, who the people call the rubble women. She got this job from the labor exchange. She has to feed two children on her small salary. Ellie, Luisa and Hans have been taken in by a Dresden family. Before the war started, Ellie's life was very different. She was a violin teacher in Wroclaw, Silesia. Her family had been doing quite well for a long time, until the Red Army made its way to Wroclaw in 1945. Like thousands of refugees, Ellie and her family were forced to head west in icy cold weather. Ellie's parents and many others didn't survive the torturous journey. Ellie's husband, Walter, died in 1943 on the Eastern Front, and she lost sight of her sister, Gerda, during the chaotic escape to Dresden. But Ellie hasn't given up hope of finding Gerda again. Vorsicht am Bahnsteig, an Zugbett ein. Öffnet die Schranke schnell. Nicht so laut. Wir wollen der Frau Winter nicht verärgern. Komm hier. Wenn wir wieder unser eigenes Haus haben, dann machen wir so viel Kraft, wie wir wollen. Dann können wir so laut sein, wie wir wollen. As always, Ellie tries to make the best of every situation. Guck mal, was habe ich da? Eine Hand für Hans und Luise. Toys are hard to come by in post-war Germany. The Dresden City Museum owns a large collection of handmade toys. Each one of them is unique. They were usually made by parents and grandparents who had utilized creative solutions to make them. 
Die Kinder hatten ja nichts. The children didn't have anything to play with. During the war, the only items that were made were things that could be used in the war. Children's toys didn't make the list, so people had to use their imagination and craft new toys for their little ones, made from bits and bobs that were lying around, made from whatever they could find, really. They even carved them themselves. They used all kinds of different material. Painted cardboard was turned into cars and ships. Metal or wooden scraps and a few screws were used to make little steamers, locomotives and tram wagons. While their parents fight for their survival day in, day out, most children are left on their own, at least during the day. The mountains of rubble in the bombed cities become their playgrounds, filled with things to climb. But beneath the rubble lurks great danger. The city is littered with live ammunition and deep bomb craters. Dramatic accidents are sadly a frequent occurrence. Necessity begets ingenuity. This also applies to clothing. Every piece of fabric is reused. Uniform fabric in particular, it's robust, warm and widely available. Curtains and tablecloths are turned into clothes, too. Everything that's not completely worn down is stitched into something new. The misery and lack of necessities was so great that people did almost everything imaginable to meet their needs. Everything was pulled out of their closets and cupboards and made into something new. Take what you've got and turn it into something new. Ellie has become more than accustomed to this. She repairs her broken shopping bag with yarn made from rolled newspaper. Knitting paper, as it was called, was used fairly often for crocheting and knitting back then. Not only is it extremely strong, it's also quite durable. While it might seem easy to make, the process actually requires some skill. First, the newspaper is cut into thin strips. Each strip is twisted up very tightly and glued together piece by piece until the paper yarn is long enough. Bent bike spokes often serve as knitting needles. Recycling is a virtue. Many of these products born of necessity often bear no traces of their former uses. This lid of a weck jar was once part of a gas mask made by former arms manufacturers that have now started producing household supplies. A gas mask canister becomes a milk can or a lunchbox. Millions of bullet casings are scattered all over the destroyed cities. They are now used as screwdriver handles or welded together as pot saucers. The dreaded glass mines are converted into simple weck jars, steel helmets into colanders. The German newsreels celebrate the industry's return to making consumer goods. Die Waffenschmieden der Welt produzieren nicht mehr das, was die Menschheit fürchtet, sondern das, was sie braucht. The market is not only dominated by large businesses. The market conditions are ripe for many medium-sized companies, too. Mechanics and craftsmen put their entire range of skills to use to turn scraps either found themselves or acquired from someone into mass production items. Back then, people used to say, where there's a barrack, there's a businessman. Wie vorher schon Stahlhelme und Flugzeugteile, wird jetzt ein weiteres Kriegsgerät, die Panzerfaust, friedlicher und nützlicher Verwendung in Küche und Haushalt zugeführt. Hingesetzt und Messer gewetzt. Was kocht denn die Mutti heute Schönes? Hä? hä? Was gibt's heute? Es gibt Kartoffeln. Ja, Kartoffeln. Und als Beilage? <lacht> genau, herrliche Gabeln. Wir lassen uns einfach überraschen. Hä? Potatoes with forks is typical post-war humor, poking fun at the dire situation. Ellie keeps the skins of the valuable vegetables. 
Potatoes contain solanine. That's why they foam like soap and make a perfect cleaning agent or detergent. <laughs> There are lots of disagreements in the reluctantly shared flat. The Winklers, a retired couple, live on the poverty line as well. Now, first of all, imagine being driven out of your home in um, uh, wherever in Silesia, right? Uh, and then uh, you show up in a place like Dresden, which is where you're supposed to settle, and there's no place for you to live, and there's nothing to eat for you and your family. I mean, the Germans who lived in, in these cities and towns didn't want the refugees. When you look at human beings in a situation of stress and difficulty, of shortage of food, of cold and hunger, it's very hard to expect altruistic activity from those people. You know, war brings out the worst in human beings. Da hängen ja noch die halben Kartoffeln an der Schale. So wie du das machst, ist es kein Wunder, dass kein Mensch satt wird. Sind wir mal froh, dass meine Kinder bei Ihnen das Mausen so gut gelernt haben, Frau Winkler, und dabei so erfolgreich sind? Mousing means stealing, a crime. But faced with a horrible food shortage, people hardly have a choice. There's not much to find in the cities, so countless families go on hoarding trips to the farmers in the countryside. They exchange whatever they can for food, or they steal from the fields. Potatoes are much in demand. It's usually the children who do this type of work. If they get caught, the farmers often turn a blind eye. Ellie doesn't want her children to steal, but they need to be fed every day. She often resorts to baking Russian bread, as it's called, a mix of rye meal, sugar beets, and flour made from ground straw. They put a substitute for liver sausage on their slices of bread, but it's made without meat. Instead, it contains fat, oatmeal, and some condiments, and is called Stalin's bread. It's not very nutritious, but it fills empty stomachs. Food is strictly rationed and can only be bought with food stamps. Ellie has to give some of hers to the Winklers to cover the rent. As retirees, the city of Dresden only provides them with the absolute minimum. The Winklers have Category 5 ration cards, also known as the Cemetery Card, accounting for less than 1,000 calories per person and day. Only employees and workers are given higher categories. The workers doing the hardest labor are best off. They get up to 2,200 calories per day. The Winklers are lucky. Due to her job as a rubble woman, Ellie's job falls in this category. Die schwerste Arbeit sieht man dir gar nicht an. Einfach Danke hätte auch gereicht. Von Danke ist noch niemand satt geworden. Ellie doesn't have time to argue. She has to hurry to get to work on time. Not least because she has to take a couple of detours on her way there. Many roads are still completely blocked. More than one and a half years after Dresden was bombed, only the major streets have been cleared of rubble. They are lined with ruins. Back then, it seemed impossible to fathom that the city would come back to life. It was basically dead. That was the prevailing feeling everyone had. The only city struggling more with post-war rubble is Berlin. Everywhere you look, you see piles of rubble. To get to her workplace in the Johannstadt district, Ellie has to cross the river. She passes through the hardest-hit neighborhoods. 
Almost every house within an area of 15 square kilometers has been destroyed by the bombs and the subsequent firestorm. At least the tram is running again. Within just a few weeks after the end of the war, the city has managed to repair the tracks and overhead wires. The Augustus Bridge across the Elbe can once again be crossed by tram too. Ellie likes taking the tram. She meets her friend Maria at the stop Sachsenplatz. Maria knows how to get through these tough years. Maria, was denn du raus? Kannst doch nicht einfach so Geld verbrennen. Und dein Kleid, siehst schick aus. Danke, Ellie. Mein neuer Freund hat's mir gekauft. Hast schon wieder einen neuen an der Angel? Männer kommen und gehen, Ellie, weißt du doch. Mein neuer heißt Alexei. Was denn, Russe? Er ist sogar Offizier. Ich sag zu ihm, Sascha. Relations between the Soviet occupying forces and the residents of Dresden are tense. When the war ended, many Soviet soldiers raped women, and violence was commonplace. This has fueled fear. But there were also some amorous relationships between Soviet soldiers and German women. Sometimes it's their personal distress or the general lack of men that attract the women to the soldiers. Officers are better off and therefore particularly popular. Across all occupation zones, the occupiers were the ones in control of essential products. So for those who didn't have anything, being on good terms with the occupiers could be extremely useful. And for women, a liaison with an occupying soldier was a viable option too. Lach dir doch auch einen Russen an. Die Steineklopferei bringt dich nicht weit. Ein Offizier würde dir gut stehen. Der kann viel für dich tun. Hier für dich. Sascha hat gute Beziehungen. Er kommt sogar an Wein. Das kann ich nicht annehmen, Maria. Doch, kannst du. Wirklich? Auf alle Fälle. Danke. Komm doch bei mir vorbei heute Abend. Um sechs habe ich Schluss. Und dann, dann erzählst du mir mehr von deinem tollen Offizier. Oh ja, das mache ich. Wir sehen uns heute Abend. Although Dresden looks like a wasteland of ruins, the city is trying to establish some sense of normality. Weekly cultural events are held. Theater plays, song recitals and concerts take place in theaters on the outskirts of the city or in improvised halls. Documents show that over 150 events were held in the first year after the war alone, all of them sponsored by the occupiers. Soviets almost immediately had a cultural program which they set up. And this cultural program was very purposeful. You know, the idea was to show the Germans, you know, that we were a people of culture. And for the Soviets, this is what this meant. It meant symphony concerts. It meant opera. It meant uh, classical plays. They want to show Germans that Russians are not barbarians, right? Which is one of the things that the Nazis taught the German citizens, and that many Germans thought. Listening to a violin concert again, the thought wistfully reminds Ellie of her past as a violin teacher. Suchen Sie Arbeit. Wie bitte? Arbeit. Es gibt Stellen. Sind Sie Genossin? Nein, bin ich nicht. New schools are looking for new teachers, but for Ellie, there is no way back to her old job as a music teacher. While the Soviet government is replacing 75% of all teachers to promote political change, they only accept working class candidates with allegiance to the party. In the upcoming state elections in September 1946, the occupiers support the newly founded Sozialistische Einheitspartei Deutschlands, the Socialist Unity Party of Germany, or in short, SED. The SED becomes their driving force. Sie versprechen, dass alles bald besser wird. 
The rubble clearance is used in socialist propaganda as well and deemed as a necessary service to the people. The workday begins at 9 a.m., eight hours a day, six days a week. Here come. We're waiting. I'm here, I'm here. Faster. Ellie didn't volunteer to do this heavy labor. She was required to do so. Has she already said something? No. Ellie works in a team with two other women at the Carola House construction site, overseen by a professional construction company. Skilled workers guide the unskilled women. Each group receives detailed instructions on what to do. Safety regulations? Negative. Before they start, the workers have to gather together. Come here. Come. Es geht vorwärts, Genossen. Und das bedeutet nicht nachlassen. Wir verdoppeln die Anstrengung. Auch wenn ihr oft die Schnauze voll habt, vergesst nie: Wir Sozialisten führen die Massen. Unser Aufbauplan ist der Wille des Volkes. Und jetzt an die Arbeit, Genossen. Der Arbeitskräftebedarf 1940. The need for workers in 1946 was enormous. It was even greater in the East because the Soviets had disassembled all kinds of industrial sites. They considered this to be a form of reparation. Tractors, cars, locomotives, they took everything away. The East Germans now had to do this labor manually. Ihr macht diesen Bereich hier. Stapelt die Steine zu großen Blöcken. Wie sollen wir uns denn noch mehr anstrengen ohne was im Bauch? Mhm. Wir schaufeln hier noch 100 Jahre. Lass dich auch gern. Den Schutt hier rein. Und jetzt, Genossen, bildet ihr eine Kette. Da drüben. The bucket line. The easiest way to move the mountains of debris, especially in the early years. Shovel by shovel, stone by stone, muscle power in place of machines. Ellie and the others work hand in hand. They move tons of material each day. But it's not only women who are on the front lines grinding away. Many men are on the working squad too. To speed things up, the city regularly recruits volunteers. About 50,000 people take part in the clearing efforts. But due to the extent of the destruction, Dresden won't be free of rubble until 1957, the last major German city to achieve this goal. Many cities are facing the same question as Dresden. Where to put all the rubble? To make room for reconstruction, the debris has to be taken out of the city via the rubble railway, steam locomotives, with tipper wagons. The trains take the rubble to dumpsters on the fringes of the city or to parks. Across the city, lots of dumps are growing and growing. At the Kolwitz Ufer riverbank, the street is elevated by three meters due to the rubble. But the city also lacks material to rebuild houses. Ellie and her colleagues have to set aside all stones that can be reused and clean them. Breaking stones, removing residual mortar, is even rewarded with a bonus. The objective, 30 bricks per hour per worker. It's almost impossible to meet this goal. Working amongst the rubble is also dangerous. The rocks can hide anything. Glass splinters, rusty screws, or unexploded bombs. Thick gloves are the only protection the workers have. Of course, many accidents occurred because nobody was able to clear all the dangerous things lying around there fast enough. And of course, you never knew where the next bomb would explode. 
Think of what we do today when an unexploded bomb is found. Entire neighborhoods are evacuated. Back then the city was full of them. Everyone working in the rubble was faced with this risk the entire time, men and women alike. The burnt-out ruins present yet another peril. Time and again, unsupported facades suddenly collapse. People are injured or even die. With this in mind, it's even more annoying to Ellie and her colleagues that the media campaigns present their job in a completely different light. Schau, da sitzt mal wieder so ein fürchterlich feines Mannequin. Als ob die schon mal mit den Händen was gearbeitet hätte. Das sieht doch ein Blinder mit Rückstock. Sehr schön. Und jetzt entschlossen werfen. Und gleich nochmal. Wieso meint ihr, die kommt in die Zeitung? Das ist doch völliger Quatsch. Weiß ich nicht. Vielleicht. Und jetzt nimm die Schaufel. Und immer schön fröhlich, ja? Genau. Und lächeln. Women smiling happily, selflessly helping rebuild Germany. A popular image back then reinforcing the myth of the heroines of the nation. The city archives in Dresden have documented the many hundreds of photos showing the same unchanging motifs. But it's been long proven that not all pictures depicted reality. Looking at these photos, you always have to keep in mind that some of them were staged. You can tell when the women look very fresh. Sometimes they're even wearing makeup or dresses that are not dirty at all. If you find these images in the archives, you will see that it's not just one shot. It's a whole series of photos. The original negatives also reveal that the photographers corrected the poses of the women or rearranged their costumes. Most of the so-called rubble women only did this work briefly because they were actually students or housewives. The reason for this fake news lies in the grim history behind the removal of the rubble. There are very few photos of the first years, but the removal operations in the bombed cities actually started during the war, long before Dresden was destroyed. First soldiers from the Wehrmacht clear the rubble, but when an increasing number of them are sent to the front lines, forced laborers take their place. As early as 1941, prisoners of war are forced to do the job. In 1942, on the Führer's order, prisoners from the concentration camps take over, grouped into 600 strong construction brigades. So by the end of the war, a system had been established in which it was clear that cleaning up rubble was a punishment. It was done by those who didn't belong to society. After the war, authorities rushed to change this image. Attractive, smiling women now represent this task. The stories about their selfless service fill countless pages in women's magazines, a gigantic media campaign that also works in Dresden. Rubble women became iconic figures, proving that women were also made for doing a man's job. The idea was A, to complete the socialist mindset of equality, and B, to create a workforce. In West Berlin, the Americans even commissioned Oscar-winning Hollywood director William Wyler to cast the rubble women in a heroic light. Here. Hilda, danke. Der ist für dich. Wo hast du die denn her? There isn't always something to eat during the lunch break, and there certainly isn't any fruit. Ta -da! The newspaper that Johanna has managed to get hold of is a real luxury, too. Ah, Politik. Ist ja gut. Ich blätter ja schon weiter. Oh, vielleicht können wir ja bald mal zusammen ins Theater. Hm? The major theatres have been destroyed, but in June 1945, 
the first makeshift theatres opened their doors all over the city. Even the canteen of a former armaments factory has been turned into a theatre hall. The programme is filled with colourful, life-affirming reviews. People were actually just trying to start a new life. Many young women were dressing up, trying to go out dancing somewhere, trying to live some kind of life again, escaping their daily lives in the rubble. People had a real zest for life. Hier, das hört sich doch gut an. Ich tanzt hier im Café Schwalbe. Da finde ich vielleicht auch mal einen zum Heiraten. Mensch, Ellie, die suchen jemanden, der Violine kann. Was? Zeig mal. Da musst du dich unbedingt melden, Ellie. Endlich raus aus dem ganzen Dreck und Staub hier. Aber ich habe gar keine Geige. Ich weiß, wo du eine herbekommen kannst. Neustadt. Vom Schwarzmarkt? Und wovon soll sie die bitte bezahlen? If Ellie really wants to go to the audition, she urgently needs her own instrument. She had to leave her violin behind in Wroclaw. Meint ihr, das reicht? Heiliger Bimbam, <laughs> das reicht ja für ein ganzes Orchester. <laughs> ja, du bist eine berühmte Violinistin. Wir schummeln beim Vorarbeiter für dich. Hau ab. Los. Danke. Ellie doesn't think twice, because there's something else that weighs heavily on her mind. Three months ago, an official missing persons office was opened in the Neustadt district. This is where Ellie is headed. The lines are long. Thousands of people are looking for their relatives. Like almost all government departments, it is located in a part of the city that hasn't been completely destroyed. Many refugees live in camps along the outskirts of the city. At this time, they are the best source of information for anyone looking for somebody. If families are reunited, it's usually down to luck. Haben Sie diese Frau gesehen? Sie hat ein graues Kleid an. Nein, kenne ich nicht. Habe ich noch nie gesehen. Millions of Germans lost their home during the war. They fled or were displaced. Their whereabouts are unknown. They can't be found. Wenn Sie jemanden aus Pressberg, wir suchen nach unseren Verwandten. Nein. Sie sind uns los. Tut mir leid, nein. Zeigen Sie her. Sie suchen Ihre Schwester? Ja. Da kann ich Ihnen behilflich sein. To many, this simply was a business opportunity. But they might have actually just stolen the information they had from the various missing people posters people had put up themselves. They rang at people's doors, claimed to work with the missing person's office, and people often paid them, and of course, they never saw their money again. Ich bin der Beste hier in Dresden. Nein. Denken Sie drüber nach. These corrupt businesses flourish because the efforts of local and regional organizations are rarely successful in the beginning. So those looking for a loved one are willing to clutch at any straw. This is also true for Dresden residents who had to leave their homes after the bombs rained down. The ruins are covered with messages, questions and answers. There is nothing that people are more concerned about than the whereabouts of their families. Systematic search operations can only begin once the Central Search Service for Missing Germans in the Soviet Occupation Zone of Germany is established. This gives Ellie and many others much hope. The Dresden field office is a melting pot for all kinds of people affected by the war. They are not only looking for civilians, but also German prisoners of war or returnees. Where are the soldiers? Finding them is one of the most pressing tasks for the office. For years, the occupying forces haven't exchanged information or documents. 
Back then, more than 20 million people were officially missing in Germany. There seems to be no reasonable chance of finding a loved one again. But despite all the despair, hope prevails. In Germany alone, one in four Germans was either looking for someone or was being looked for. The search for missing people, therefore, had a very personal dimension. It is fair to assume that every family was looking for at least one of their members. The fate of children has the highest priority. Half a million don't know where their parents are. Many of them are still so young, they don't even know their last names, not to mention the name of their hometown. In the worst cases, there's only a photograph of them in the tracing file. At the German Red Cross in Munich, search documents fill the largest missing person search archive in the world. The records show how desperate people were and how they tried to achieve the seemingly impossible. To find family members of parentless children, authorities across the various occupation zones work closely together. In 1946, they publish an all-German booklet filled with individual pictures of the searching children. The descriptions with the photos include every known detail, as small as it may be. Name unbekannt. Reagiert auf Hansi. Blond. Nummer 34. Name unbekannt. Geboren etwa 1942. Preußischer Klang. Herkunft unbekannt. Die Kinder wurden sehr genau erfasst. Information on the children was recorded in great detail. They wrote down which clothes they were wearing when they were found. Special features like scars or molds were noted down, but also memories they might have of their former homes, even if it was just that they lived on a farm or in a housing block. These children are looking for their parents. Penguin helps find them. This is the name of the magazine headed by author Erich Kessner that supports the search officer's work. But the great breakthrough doesn't happen until the weekly newsreel, The Eyewitness, is shown in cinemas. Ruth Lemme, Geburtsort unbekannt, acht Jahre alt. Dieter Kern weiß nur seinen Namen und kam aus dem Wartegau. Ich heiße Gisela Krause, ich suche meine Angehörigen. Meine Eltern sind durch Bombenangriff umgekommen. Ich selber war verschüttet. In the first year, the newsreel proves to be quite successful. Thousands of children are reunited with their parents. The result is impressive. Of the half a million children looking for their parents, only 4,000 haven't found them. In the case of missing adults, the operation mainly relies on the filing system. This means Ellie has to first register her sister. Guten Tag. Guten Tag. Ich suche meine Schwester. Können Sie sich auch ausweisen? Hm? Ja. Bitte schön. Ellie is lucky to own a passport. Since she's registered with the authorities, her chances of finding her sister increase. Danke sehr. Sie füllen diese beiden Karten bitte aus. Das ist Ihre Stammkarte. Die ist für Ihre eigenen Daten. Auf die andere schreiben Sie alle Angaben zu der Person, die Sie suchen. Mhm. Prüfen Sie sorgfältig, ob auch wirklich alles stimmt, junge Frau. Und dann geben Sie mir beide zurück. The main idea of the missing person search is a double file. It's based on the assumption that every searching person is also being looked for and that both of them file their personal data in a master card at a search center. Master and search cards are then filed in alphabetical order in the search register. They thought that if you file both cards alphabetically together in one index, search card and master card will undoubtedly have to meet. That's why they called it the meeting procedure. And this would enable people to be reunited. The idea behind it was that if people don't run into each other in the street, they could at least meet in a register. The search offices register millions of inquiries. 
the challenge back in the day was that the different occupied zones used different systems. It was only in 1954 that they combined all registers from the various occupied zones. This led to 50,000 successful reunions. People who had been waiting this whole time to be reunited with their loved ones, but couldn't be found because they were in different locations. Danke schön, Frau Göbel. Alles ist ausgefüllt. Und wie geht's jetzt weiter? Wenn Ihre Schwester dasselbe tut und Sie wiederum als vermisst meldet, stehen die Chancen gut, dass wir Sie finden. Aber das kann einige Zeit dauern. Ich kann Ihnen nichts versprechen, verstehen Sie? Sie müssen ein wenig Geduld haben. Wir sind bald in jeder Stadt, Frau Göbel. Danke sehr. Tears won't change anything. Ellie thinks of her children and, determined, heads to the black market. She wants to go to Hellerstraße near the Neustadt station. This street is where the bartering takes place in Dresden. The stalls are almost empty, food cards are not worth much, and the Reichsmark is volatile. The black market is the last resort. And the black market was a very common, you know, very common thing everywhere. I mean, it was illegal, but they existed everywhere. So you sold and bought, and you usually you sold your family's um, uh, valuables, the jewelry, uh, furs, clothes, shoes, everything, you know, that could be bartered uh, for something on the black market. Cigarettes are a popular currency. In times of need, people often smoke a lot, and cigarettes suppress hunger. All consumer goods at the black market can be bought with cigarettes. Mm, yeah, Fifteen cigarettes. For clothes and food, the price in cigarettes is quite high. These are the most sought-after items because they are extremely limited. Many of the goods on offer come from old army stocks. The demand for canned foods is particularly high. Clever traffickers make a mint selling them. The black market was, of course, illegal. Getting caught there was considered a criminal act. But then again, everybody did it because it was simply necessary to survive. Ellie hopes she won't be seen in the crowd and hopes that one of the dealers is trying to sell a violin. But musical instruments aren't standard products on the black market. Suchen Sie was Bestimmtes? Eigentlich suche ich eine Geige. Haben Sie jemanden gesehen, der sowas hat? Normalerweise läuft das hier andersrum. Aber für eine schöne junge Dame habe ich vielleicht genau das Richtige auf Lager. Wirklich? Kommen Sie mit. Wohin denn? Na, in mein Lager. Hm? Of all things, Ellie has come across a wholesaler specializing in stolen goods. The warehouse is brimming with food obtained in dodgy dealings, wine, coffee, cans, and many more products that the man sells illegally. Dealing in stolen goods is strictly prohibited. In the Soviet zone, it counts as stealing public property. Wollen Sie nicht lieber was anderes? Ellie could even obtain forged food cards here. Nein, ich wollte wirklich einfach nur eine Geige. Musical instruments have little value, but in difficult times, nothing is for free. The post-war era has been nicknamed Time of the Wolves because everyone is looking out for themselves and their own survival. Was ist sie dir denn wert, junges Fräulein? Two packs of cigarettes. That should be enough for a violin. Ich hab die hier. Oh, nein, 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 nein. Das ist viel zu wenig. So ein schönes Stück. Hm. 
Nimm sie ruhig in die Hand. Ellie still has a necklace she inherited from her mum. It's the only valuable object she owns. Dies aus Gold. Gold jewelry for a violin. Du hast doch noch was Besseres zu bieten als die Kette. Da ließ er sich dann schon was machen. Du willst doch die Geige. Oder nicht? Kommen wir ins Geschäft. Polizei! There are regular police raids at the black market. People fear the surprise operations. The punishment is severe. Der illegale Schwarzmarkt in der Hellerstraße wurde heute durch uniformierte Polizisten geräumt. In the radio announcement, police remind people that illegally obtaining black market goods is punishable. And so Ellie is arrested and brought to the police prison building on Schießgasse. The situation is precarious. Dealing stolen food is considered an act against the system in the Soviet occupation zone. In certain instances, it can even be punishable by death. Was machen die mit uns? Sag bloß nichts gegen den Kommunismus, sonst bringen sie dich zu den Russen. Bei denen muss es richtig schlimm sein, hört man. Menschen verschwinden einfach. Gott sei Dank sind wir hier bei unserer Polizei. Mein Vetter haben die Russen vor über vier Monaten verhaftet. Wir wissen nichts von ihm, nicht mal, ob er überhaupt noch lebt. While law enforcement is under German self-governance, the Soviet occupiers interfere whenever they see fit. Since the end of the war, all those suspected of criticizing the socialist system are convicted in fast-track trials. Most of the trials were not public. That means they were not open to the public. Nobody reported on them. That's the first thing. But what's way worse is that the people on trial usually didn't have a defense lawyer. That means they had to defend themselves, if they were able to do that at all, if they had any legal notions. But that was probably not the case for the majority of people. Convicted civilians end up in prisons run by the Soviet secret police. Secrecy surrounds the situation of the prisoners. But the Soviet prisons known as the GPU basements are infamous. From today's perspective, we can assume that the population lived in fear, worried that they might be next, for whichever reason. Neither the prisoners nor their families are informed about where they are brought and whether they will return one day. Depictions from former prisoners portray the inhumane conditions in the overcrowded basements and camps. Violence is commonplace. But there are not only the basements. The Soviet secret police also create so-called special camps, either in the prisons or on former concentration camp grounds like Buchenwald and Sachsenhausen. The prisoners range from Nazi war criminals to rebellious teenagers. Exact statistics only come to light once the Soviet archives are opened. About 150,000 people were imprisoned. 40,000 of them didn't survive incarceration. Ellie Göbel? Yeah. Mitkommen zur Befragung. Ich kannte den Mann nicht. Ich wollte nur eine Geige kaufen. Ich habe nicht doch gemacht. nicht so rum. Du bist eine Diebin. Die ganze Stadt ist voll von Pack wie dir. Alexander Sergejewitsch, Offizier. Ich übernehme das. Du kommst mit mir. When a Soviet officer wants to take a prisoner, the German police is powerless. Sie können wegtreten, Genosse. Komm, es wartet jemand auf dich. 
Nun komm schon. Ellie is expecting the worst and her children don't even know where she is. Ellie! Maria! Shh, es ist alles gut. Beruhige dich. Du bist in Sicherheit. Das ist Alexei. Du musst besser auf dich aufpassen, Schätzchen. Was machst du bloß für Sachen? Deine Kolleginnen haben mir gesagt, wo du hin bist und was du vorhast. Und dann habe ich von der Razzia gehört. Was hast du dir denn überhaupt dabei gedacht? Wir bringen dich jetzt nach Hause, Liebes, ja? Oh, die haben wir für dich gesichert. Meinen vollen Namen kennen Sie ja jetzt schon. Aber bitte nennen Sie mich Sascha. Ellie. Ellie learns that her children are fine and that the Winklers are looking after them. She was lucky and even got a violin for the audition at Plauen Opera. Now it's in Ellie's hands. Will she be able to convince the jury at the Opera House after so many months of not playing? She doesn't have a lot of time. But she makes it. Ellie is one of the first women to be accepted to the Plauen Dance Orchestra as the third violin. She even gets an apartment for her children and herself. She never finds her sister Gerda. Ellie Goebel's story is not biographical, but it tells of a life in a destroyed city, surrounded by rubble day in, day out, and of strong women who follow their dreams against all odds and help rebuild a country that lies in ruins.